ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله فانه من يطع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يعص الله ورسوله فلا يضر الا نفسه ولا يضر الله شيئا اما بعد فاوصيكم واياي بتقوى الله تعالى كما قال جل وعلا في كتابه المجيد يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون my honored brothers and sisters, we begin by praising and thanking Allah, the Exalted, the Almighty. And I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship and unconditional obedience, save the one true God. And I bear witness that Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, is the last of his prophets and his final messenger. My honored brothers and sisters, we continue in our series of khutab, where we have been discussing a beautiful moment from the house of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it is an exchange narrated in a long and beautiful hadith between Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and between his beloved wife Aisha bintu Abi Bakr radiallahu anha, our mother, the mother of the believers. And in this hadith, 11 homes are mentioned. And some of the scholars, including Ibn Hajar, have mentioned that these are probably homes from the times of Jahiliyyah the times of pre-Islamic ignorance from the area of Yemen. And so the homes vary and they have different problems and different good characteristics that are indicative of life. We learn from each one. Some of the people are full of praise. And so we learn good qualities and good habits to build in our homes, whether we are husbands or wives, children, or in our other relationships as friends. And some of the women complain and we learn annoying behaviors or destructive behaviors that we should avoid. And the hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim and other, uh, also related by other scholars. An Aisha radiallahu anha qalat, Jalasa ihda ashara mra'atan, fata'a hadna, wata'a qadna, alla yaktumna min akhbari azwajihinna shay'a. That on the authority of Aisha radiallahu anha, she said that 11 women sat together and agreed to not hide anything from the news of their homes. And the first two to briefly remind you were both women that complained about their husbands. And so we learned annoying or destructive behaviors from both parties that we should avoid even without knowing who's really at fault. We learn from the environment of the house. قالت الأولى زوجي لحم جمل غث على رأس جبل وعر that the first woman likened her husband to a sort of meal. And we said the camel meat to the Arabs was like grade D meat for Americans. It was less desirable. And she gave this analogy of a mountain, that this undesirable meal was at the top of a mountain, that although he was not good in character, he was also extremely arrogant. And we learned a lot you can go back to the hadith or to the recording of the khutbah on YouTube to learn more. But some of what we learned was to be cautious to come down off the mountain in our households. That from the most destructive things in the home is the ego and the pride when it seeps in and we can't forgive. We can't let go. We can't be humble with one another. We can't let mistakes go for one another. This mountain, we have to descend it in our relationships at home and our relationships outside the home and especially in our Muslim communities. And in the second home, قالت الثانية زوجي لا أبث خبره إني أخاف ألا أذره إن أذكره أذكر عجره وبجره that we said that this woman, she said, I will not mention anything about my husband, but what she mentioned was very destructive. She said that he has outer faults that everybody knows. Perhaps he's short-tempered, perhaps he has a, a foul speech. And so people outside the home would know this. But she said he also has inner faults 
that only she knows because of her closeness to him. And we reminded one another that marriage is not just a, a biological thing for us as Muslims. It's not just something that everyone does. But indeed, as taught in the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, this special trust happens by the permission of Allah alone. By His permission, some things became halal between the husband and wife that we don't even do with our own parents. And this trust comes with a huge responsibility. As we enjoy from our children and our spouses, those beautiful qualities that no one else has that level of closeness to, but we also were all human beings. And we learn faults, we learn shortcomings that no one else knows. And we should be careful to guard these with the sanctity and the decency that is deserving by our being Muslims and our trust before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we talked about al-ghiba, and we talked about al-buhtan, we talked about the danger of backbiting and slandering, and how these are big sins, which many people will be regretful about on the Day of Judgment, and perhaps there are few that have as more right to the goodness of our speech than our own family. And also we talked about a lot more than that. You can go back and review and study the hadith or look at the recording. Today, inshallah, we enter the third household. And I know we've been having a lot of complaints. This third woman complains also. And so we'll learn some problematic behaviors to, to avoid. But the good news is the fourth woman is a very, very flowing praise of her husband. So we'll keep going back and forth with the hadith some bad behaviors to avoid and some very good behaviors to put in ourselves. قالت الثالثة زوج العشنق إن أنطق أطلق وإن أسكت وعلق Very, very short, except it has some difficult words. She says, زوج العشنق I can't translate العشنق, I'll define it in a moment. But this عشنق, what's his description? She says, if I speak, he'll divorce me. And if I'm silent, then I'll be suspended. Not really a wife, but I'm not divorced and I can't go. So very short but profound description where she's talking about being really stuck because you either speak or you're silent. There's no other choice. And so what she's saying is if I speak, I'm stuck. And if, I, and if I'm silent, I'm stuck. So what she's saying is a very, very powerful analogy. And even most Arabic speakers won't know this word. It's not a common word. So pay attention to the definition. You know in English, if we want to describe a person who's tall, what do we say? We say he's tall. There isn't much other uh, uh, choice in the language. But the Arabic language has an enormous vocabulary. And this is from the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon this language, the language of the Qur'an. You know in the Arabic language, the lion, there are more than 60 different words describing the lion. The animal, the lion, 60 different Arabic words. Each one with a meaning, each one with an indication. So also there are more than a half dozen words in Arabic that describe being tall. The most common one that most of us uh, Arabic speakers will be familiar with is tawil, that means tall. But there are levels of height above that. And so there's something called tawal, and then there's more, and there's something called ashan nat with a ta. And she's using like the fifth level of height, ashan naq, which means you really look up to him, right? Very tall person. It's a specific type of height. And some scholars said that she's criticizing her husband as if the only good thing about him is that he's tall. Other than that, it's, it's, it's all problems. But some of the scholars extracted something really subtle in the language. If you get this, you will understand the heart of what she's complaining about. And remember, she's not complaining about something that's only in men. In fact, this is a behavior that we men and women, even that aren't uh, as parents, as children, in all of our relationships, we have to be careful of. So, عشنق, how does that differ from tawil, just tall? Al-Ashannaq is a tall person 
that has an elongated neck, a very, very long but thin neck. And it's a description when the head is kind of disproportionately small. And so you have an, uh, in your imagination, like this small head on top of this long but scrawny neck with this very, very tall person. So many scholars notice something subtle. And this is, you know, the balagha of the Arabic language, the powerful rhetoric. When you say something in a, in a, in a very interesting way, so people extract it. They said, no, no, she's not physically describing him. She is criticizing his foolishness and his small mind. As if she is saying, well, if it's a small head, it's a small brain, right? So she's saying she has this, his small mindedness about him. And the distance between the mind and the heart is very large. And subhanAllah, when you understand it, it's worse than a, than a curse, honestly. It's a very strong uh, criticism of this man. But what she's saying is that he becomes either a heart without a mind or a mind without a heart. As if, imagine, you know the, 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 the connection distance is very long and so sometimes the message gets stuck in between. That's the analogy that's being drawn. So, what is she speaking about? In fact, description aside, she is criticizing a behavior that virtually every single one of us, men and women, children and adults, have fallen into at some point in our lives. Except those that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mercy on. And we ask Allah to protect us from the evil of our souls and from bad character. Allahumma ameen. What she's criticizing is a small mindedness when a person speaks to you. And some of us, we have this characteristic not only with our, our spouses, but our children and our friends. When people talk to us, they're measuring every single word. Because they know if they say one word incorrectly, you'll snap. That's what she's talking about. And virtually every one of us has been guilty of this at some time with some person in our lives. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes a different goal for us in the Qur'an. The goal of being righteous believers. He says, Those that restrain and put down their anger and they pardon and they forgive people. And that's why to be honest, my brothers and sisters, today's khutbah is not easy. It is heavy on me to share it with you and it is heavy on you to receive because it takes big hearts and, why, and open minds to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the tawfiq to have the good characteristic to not be worthy of this description because many of us are like this. We, are, we take forever to forgive one another and we hold long grudges and when people speak to us, we're short-tempered. Even if, alhamdulillah, Allah protects us from foul speech or something, we're just difficult to address sometimes because we're a little bit hot-tempered or a little bit, you, you know, uh, uh, quick to respond and to interpret things in a negative way. And there's a beautiful uh, line of poetry for Imam al-Shafi'i that helps us understand what characteristic we should be going for instead. He says, لَيْسَ بِحَبِيبٍ مَنْ اِحْتَجْتَ إِلَى مُدَرَاتِهِ That the true friend is not the one who when you speak to him, you're trying to navigate what might set him off. مُدَرَاتِهِ in the Arabic language is like you're navigating and trying not to hit a trigger. Not to, in English, what do we say? Push a person's buttons. So all of us have buttons, all of us have things that upset us, but some of us are wired with buttons top to bottom. So people are afraid to speak to us. Anything they say, we might not give them a chance to explain. We might not give them a chance 
to, 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 to take back a mistake, we're quick to react. And the poem continue, continues, بَلِ الْحَبِيبُ مَنْ تَلَقَّى نَفْسَكَ بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ وَلَا تُبَالِي But rather the true friend is the one who receives you, if you will, with open arms, and you're not afraid to speak to him. And if this is important in friendship, this is all the more important where? In our homes. Not just with our spouses. That we start with our spouses and that we're safe and secure with one another. I feel that when I speak well, my spouse is going to appreciate me. And we talked about appreciation last time and the name of Allah is Shakur. They will celebrate our successes and push that further and further. But then when I slip up, and brothers and sisters, let us have the courage to say, we all slip up, we all make mistakes. I can count on my spouse to cover my faults and to help me be better. And this is imp if this is important with our spouses, then it's all the more important with our children. And many of us, our children have lost the trust in their own households. That if they open up, they fear what will happen. And so sadly what happens is they trust Facebook friends and adolescents in school and people that are far away more than they trust the household. And my brothers and sisters, there is no human being on the planet that will be more patient with one's mistakes than a father or a mother to his or her children. There is no one that will give more leash and more opportunities. And so when this trust is broken, when we're each in our rooms, on our computers, we don't even get together on the dinner table anymore, then what happens is children turn outside. And what is outside will not be in their best interest as much as any loving parent who wants to promote their connection with Allah, their connection with Islam, their deen. And you know, I don't want this to be abstract. And so there are many examples. I know as I speak, the examples from my own life come through my mind and the same happens with you. But let me give you an example of the same man that wrote those words. Imam al-Shafi'i himself. And there was, Imam al-Shafi'i was very sick and he had a, an excellent student named Ar-Rabi'a Ibn, Sul, uh, Ibn Sulaiman al-Muradi. And this was like a star student of Shafi'i. They had a very strong relationship. And so he visited him while he was sick. And what he said was a little bit unusual. Qala, qawallahu da'afaka ya imam. Which literally translated means, may Allah increase your weakness, O imam. When you hear this, it's alarming, it's offensive. But some of you, you may know, you know when you ask about someone in Arabic, you say, you know, uh, in slang, bi'afiyah, right? Or bil'afiyah, right? Wa'afiyah in Arabic language means health. So literally, this is a wrong statement. If he was healthy, he wouldn't be sick. But we say this like making dua. Insha'Allah, we hope he'll be healthy soon and up off the bed. So what he's saying can be interpreted wrong, but he doesn't mean it negatively. You understand? And sometimes in English, we have these expressions. We say something, it comes offensively, but we don't mean it. So look at the reaction of a shafi'i. He could say, how could you say this to me? What kind of respect to a teacher? Watch your tongue. All of these words that people lesser than him, we hear all the time. But a shafi'i, he makes a joke out of it. Qala, law qawwa dafi. If he increased my weakness, I'd be dead. He was saying he was very sick. So immediately Rabia noticed that the statement could be interpreted wrong. He said, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it this way. Now listen to what a shafi'i says. This should be hung up on our homes and taken as an attitude. He said, O oh Rabia, if you 
cursed me outright, meaning that there wasn't a statement that could be interpreted both ways, I would know that you didn't mean it. So this statement could be interpreted most ways, so he joked. But he said, if you said the absolute wrong thing, I would know that you didn't mean it. And so I ask Allah for, for open hearts and for patience. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us easy on our families and our children and our spouses. Allahumma ameen. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfiru Allah li wa lakum fa astaghfiru. Na huwa al-ghafuru rahim. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعد قال تعالى والذين يجتنبون كبائر الإثم والفواحش وإذا ما غضبوا هم يغفرون الله سبحانه وتعالى says about the righteous people that those that avoid major sins and immoralities, and when they become angry, they forgive and let go. And so today, when we reflect on this third house, قالت الثالثة زوج العشنق إن أنطق أطلق وإن أسكت أعلق that she said, my husband is this عشنق long distance between his mind and his heart, no empathy, small-minded. If I open my mouth, if I speak, I will be divorced on the spot. And if I'm silent, I'm suspended, neither a wife nor free to go about my life. What she described is a position of desperation. And we don't want to create desperation for our homes, for our husbands, for our wives, for our children, for our friends, for our community members. And so the alternative, my brothers and sisters, is to create spaces that are safe and secure. To train ourselves to be more patient when speaking with one another. But also, my brothers and sisters, to learn when we're angry, to restrain our behavior. And not to seek revenge or lose our boundaries with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there is a beautiful example that I want to leave you with that will symbolize this, and it is an example from the house of the Prophet ﷺ. And this is narrated in Sahih al-Bukhari uh, on the authority of Aisha and Aisha radiallahu anha. قالت, قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إني لأعرف غضبك ورضاك That the Prophet ﷺ told her, I know when you're angry with me and when you're pleased with me. And imagine this is Rasulullah talking about himself. And not like us husbands and wives that have faults and there's reason to be angry. But the best of creation. But still he's saying he knows his wife's character. قالت, قلت وكيف تعرف ذاك يا رسول الله? So Aisha asked, how do you know, O Messenger of Allah? Now listen carefully. قال, إنك إذا كنت راضية قلت بلى ورب محمد وإذا كنت ساخطة قلت لا ورب إبراهيم He said, when you're pleased with me, you say, yes, I swear by the Lord of Muhammad. And when you're upset, you say, no, I swear by the Lord of Ibrahim. Now listen to the response of Aisha. قالت قلت أجل لست أهاجر إلا اسمك. She said yes, O Messenger of Allah, that's true, but I don't leave anything but your name. So look at how this house comes in the alternative to what the third house struggled with. On one hand, the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام who, if someone's upset with him, who's losing out? Us. Not him, والسلام, he is the best of creation. And yet there are husbands and wives amongst us. We don't let our, our uh, spouses say 1% of the sentence. And we light the house on fire. But look at how he's patient with Aisha. 
and understands she's the youngest of his wives and that she's the only virgin. She, this is the first house. And so there's space even in the Prophet's house to make these little trip ups and then come back and correct our behavior. And this happens throughout the house of the Prophet ﷺ. Sometimes there are decisions that are made that are less than the best by Aisha herself despite her greatness. And yet the Prophet ﷺ reacts with patience and respect. But also my brothers and sisters, and let us be balanced in our discussion. Many people don't know the completion of this hadith that I just shared with you. What Aisha said in response. She said, yes, this is true but I don't leave anything but your name. She's saying from her anger, she says, Rabbi Ibrahim. But she doesn't stop her duties at home. She doesn't withhold her affection and her status as a, as a wife. She doesn't seek revenge through the children or lose, and I apologize, all of these things are unbefitting of Aisha, but I speak about unfortunately what we see in our homes that sometimes we lose our boundaries with Allah and we shut down in the home and we use our behavior as leverage against our spouses. And this has no space in the house of a Muslim. This has no space in the house of a mu'min. But from the Prophet والسلام, he leaves space for discussion and engagement and also from the space of Aisha as she works through her up being upset she continues to love and respect and do her duties and, and be that spouse that she committed to be. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the character of Rasulullah and the character of Aisha radiallahu anha. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to expand our hearts and grant us patience. I ask Allah for the evil, for forgiveness for the evil that has come from our hands and our tongues. I ask Allah azza wa jal to forgive us for what we have spoken and He knows better than us. I ask Allah azza wa jal to grant us tongues that are firm on what is true and what is proper. I ask Allah to make our tongues wet with His remembrance and to make uh, open our hearts for forgiveness, to grant us peace and tranquility and acceptance in our homes. I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make every tribulation a source of nearness for us to Him. I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to bring us forth on the Day of Judgment among the Ummah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa qina adhab al-nar. Allahumma ameen, ameen. Ibad Allah, inna Allah ya'muru bil-adli wal-ihsani wa ita'idhi al-qurba wa yanha'an al-fahshai.